Good morning. Welcome to St. Helena Catholic Church for the celebration of the 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. It is a joy to worship with you today. In order to preserve the sacredness of this Eucharistic celebration, we ask that all phones be silenced and out of reference, please refrain from chewing gum and texting during Mass. As Catholics, we fully participate in the celebration of the Eucharist when we receive Holy Communion. We are encouraged to receive Communion devoutly and frequently. In order to be properly prepared to receive Communion, Catholic participants should not be conscious of grave sin and should have fasted for one hour. A person who is conscious of grave sin is not to receive the body and blood of the Lord without prior sacramental confession. If you are not of our faith or outside the church, please come forward to receive a blessing. The readings for today are found in the Journeys Songbooks, number 1005C. Please stand and join in the singing of our gathering hymn. be trained. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to what I'm telling you, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. My brothers and sisters, good morning. Man, and welcome, as always, to Holy Mother Church. My brothers and sisters in Christ, throughout the week, you and I get those anxieties. Those worries, it's those conversations, the emails. This is why you and I have come, to worship him, to adore him, to talk to him. Give him your biggest hurt, your biggest worry, your biggest challenge. Talk to him and let him know. But do him a favor. And when you give it to him, do not take it back. When you come to receive him, how many times does he tell you and I that his burden is light, his yoke is easy? Why? Because he wants you to take him on and give him your worries. Do you think he doesn't know? Do you think he didn't allow it? Do you think he did it just to see how you would respond? My brothers in Christ, he's given it to you for you to grow. Allow him to help you carry it. Just don't take it back to the pew, or worse, don't take it out those doors. Remember when you come here, whose house this is, that he is God and we are not. Thank God. But more importantly, do not walk out this church with the same words you walked in here with. It's hypocritical. So now you and I have come to worship him. So let's think quickly. Look over your shoulder just briefly, y'all. Don't get all wrapped up in it. Don't let the devil get in your head. This week, man, you got your cursed, you gossip, you judge. At some point, you and I need to have a repentant heart. It's the only way to approach you. Remember the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who have a childlike reverence for God. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, that he is God and we are not. The relationship is this way. It's horizontal. It's not vertical. Therefore, you and I understand what it means to offend him. What better way to approach him than being genuine? So let us call to mind those times. I confess to Almighty God 
and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my faults, through my faults, through my most grievous faults. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Bow your head. My brother and sister in Christ in Scripture, every knee must bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Everybody who recognized Christ as the Messiah either knelt, bowed, or laid prostrate on the ground every time they met him. The reason you and I bow our heads at his name is because we've come to worship him, and it's our way of being reverent. And man, thank you for that. My brother and sister in Christ, let us pray. Lord, you are the Almighty One. You are the one that shows mercy and pardon. Lord, it is by your abundant grace that we even survive. Hasten to us, Lord, with all of your promises, for we may become, hopefully someday, the treasures of heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Man, please be seated. You know, uh, we have children's church. Okay, do I have somebody to go with them to children's church? Never thought I'd ask for that part of the equation. Oh, there we go. How are y'all? Man, come on. There you go. Trust me, it's not as bad as meet people. <laughs> okay, let us pray in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well done. Most holy and gracious Father, I now understand all too well why you say let the children come to me. Lord, may your face and that of the mother forever be upon them. We ask this through Christ our Lord. <laughs> Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Way cool. All right, we're going to go this way. Man, I like your reindeer. Oh, it's a moose. I mean, really, come on. How am I supposed to know that, y'all? I mean, really? <laughs> My brother and sister in Christ. You know why we do everything in threes? Mia Koopa, Mia Koopa, Mia Maxima Koopa. We did it in the Confiti R, right? We do it in the Gloria. It's to remind you and I that he's a triune God. 
Remember, there are many faiths today that do not believe Christ is the Messiah, that he's an ordinary man. Today we call them, they of the Mormon understanding and that of the Islam understanding, Muslim faith. So I need you to understand. That's why we're constantly repeating things in threes so that people know. That's why we incense in threes as well. Just a general reminder. My friends in Christ, you're about to hear from the book of Amos. If you don't know it, Amos is the one that did all the chocolate chip cookies way back in the day. Good. I just want to make sure you're with me. That's what I'm doing here. My brother in Christ, imagine you're 500 years before the coming of Christ. And let's be honest, King David, Solomon, Saul are all gone. Your big name players, some are there, some are not. But the problem is, Amos would be considered one of the minor prophets. Patently unfair, because in his neck of the woods, he is popular. He is a farmer, he is a shepherd, he is a take, he's a carer of uh, sycamore trees, which means he's responsible for prunes and fruits, uh, taking care of them, cultivating them. He's a man of little means. But the problem is his word goes a long way. And he's telling the people of the day that the disparity between those who have and those who have not is too great. He said the people that have not give of their means. The people that have means give of their excess. And he says we need to close the gap. He said to a point that it's just going to grow exponentially. And look at us to this day. He's saying, look, if you're not careful, he said the, the rich will dine on wines and they will dine on the right sheep. They will dine on the best of dead cow. Okay, they didn't say that. That's just my words, okay? I tell you that, why? Because he's saying that's not how it is on the other end. And if you close the disparity by sacrifice, it's the buzzword, the sacrifice, then you'll realize what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and love of neighbor. This is 500 years before the coming of Christ, and he's talking to the, to the 12, 10 tribes in the north. He calls them, sometimes he calls them by different names. He may call them Ephraim, he may call them Joseph, he may call them by a proper name, but he's referring to the 10 tribes in the north. My brothers in Christ, Amos, 500 years before the coming of the Christus. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Thus says the Lord of God of hosts, Woe to the complacent in Zion, lying upon beds of ivory, stretched comfortably on their couches. They eat lambs taken from the flock and calves from the stall, improvising to the music of the harp like David. They devise their own accompaniment. They drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best oils. Yet they are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Therefore, now they shall be the first to go into exile, and their wanton revelry shall be done away with. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My friends in Christ, have you ever been to a point where somebody scares you, just being honest. When you least expect it, somebody jumps out, somebody does something, somebody does something you just weren't aware of, and the first thing out of your mouth is, oh my God! It's just, it was almost, it was an impulse. It was almost like it was already written there for you. You ever notice that we're the only creature that can call out to a higher being? Think about what I just told you. No other creature in the world can call out to a higher being. They can only call out to equals. Animal gets hurt, animal starts running, animal gets scared. It, only can, it can yell out only to commonality, to another creature. We're the only one that can yell to an above. This is that song. You and I would have said, thank God something good happened, finally. They're going to say praise the Lord, but it's the same thing. They're saying thank God is a knee-jerk reaction to that at one time, they were being wronged, and they finally got their court date and were proved right. They finally were out without any food, and somebody was kind enough to give them food. They moved to a foreign land and had no friends, and then finally, out of nowhere, a relative, a friend, or family shows up to support them. Or the widow, who now has no one to support them, has been taken in by a family. This is the psalm they would pray when all of a sudden the world changed in their favor, which is what Amos was driving at, which is the same psalm Amos would have prayed. My brother and sister Christ, Christ, the response of the Jews and the Catholics today.
Blessed is he who keeps faith forever, through cures justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets captives free. sight to the blind. The Lord raises up those who were bowed down. The Lord loves the just. The Lord protects strangers. The fatherless and the widow he sustains. But the way of the wicked he thwarts. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, through all generations. My friends in Christ, sometimes to be in St. Paul's shoes, I think it's just, I can't even imagine, right? You, you go from nowhere to being the, the quintessential Pharisee. Money, fame, fortune. I mean, you got your own horses, you got your own wagons, chariot. I mean, you're the man. If they want somebody to come speak, I'm telling you, Saul is the one they're picking. He goes from that to the only way he makes a living is making tents. He's the only apostle, even though he's not one of the twelve. He is an apostle in that he proclaims the good news that keeps his day job as a tent maker. And just imagine, imagine the first three ships you get out on, three out of the four sink. I mean, how many, how many of us are going to follow Paul? I mean, one time he gets to an island, he finally makes a fire. He no sooner makes a fire than a, than a viper bites him. I mean, pretty soon, who wants to be around this guy? I mean, he just doesn't need the rabbit foot. He needs the whole rabbit. I mean, this guy's out the box. Well, now he's come to the end of his life, and it's in year 60. He's in prison, or he's at house arrest, but he's writing his letter to Timothy, who he refers to oftentimes as his son. He sees himself, quote, as a father. He actually sees himself as a father to many of us. So much for calling no man father. I digress. He's writing to Timothy, who is now, we believe, the pastor of Ephesus. And this is what's going on in Ephesus. Ephesus is 300, 500,000 people. It is kind of like the New Orleans of its day. It is a seaport. It is kind of like the middle point of Asia, Turkey. It is, um, let me tell you what they have. They have the Temple of Diana, which is, I'm going to tell you how big it is. It's a city block with 100 columns all the way around. It's massive. It's, a, it's larger than a city block. Eventually, the Blessed Mother will stay there with John in a house no bigger than probably 10 by 12, just down from the Princess of Diana. Diana is the princess. Uh, she's Mother Nature, so to speak. She's the goddess of lust, of love, if you have. And here's what's going on. They have a street that runs through the city that is 70 foot wide. So approximately, if you will, the, the width of our church. Some of their streets are made of marble. They have all kind of vendors all around the temple. I mean, it's, it's, it's nowhere where you want to go. He's writing Timothy to say, in his words, fight the good fight. Those are my words. Those are not his. And he's saying, look, you need to remember one thing. It's almost a pep talk. Remember who Christ is. He's the be-all, end-all. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. So there's nothing you're going to do without him that won't win the day. At the end of the day, all things come through him. You remember what you're there for. Remember who you represent. And your job is just to finish the race, not to win it. Man, he's exhorting Timothy to put his best foot forward. And he does. My friends in Christ, St. Paul, to his son, if you will, Timothy. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. But you, man of God, pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Compete well for the faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the noble confession 
in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you before God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who gave testimony under Pontius Pilate for the noble confession, to keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the blessed and only ruler will make manifest at the proper time the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, and whom no human being has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Lord, open our minds so we come to understand, our lips so we proclaim your gospel, and our heart we're all intention alive. Lord, as we always do, we bless in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to his Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. Lying at the door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten the scraps of the table that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man who also died was buried, and from the netherworld he was in torment. He raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off, Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering in torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your entire lifetime, while Lazarus received what was bad. He is now comforted here, and you will be tormented. Moreover, between you and us is a great chasm. It's established to prevent anyone from crossing from you that might wish to go from our side to yours and from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send me to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to a place of torment. Abraham replied, But Moses has the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, because if, but if someone from the dead rises, they will surely repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. If you were to ask the friends of Alan to describe him 10 words or less, they would describe him as not good, a thief, a robber, impetuous, kind of a fraud, insolent, troublesome. Those are his friends. If you were to ask the people of Great Britain what they thought of Alan, they would tell you, man, he's a rogue. He's, he's a rebel. Man, he's, if you were to ask the people of Great Britain, what position would you like Alan to hold? They would say, let's start six feet under. 
Now you know where he sits. The problem is he's a one-man riot. That's the problem. Great Britain is undergoing these massive riots. And when I'm telling you, no holes barred. There are houses being burned, businesses being burned, people are getting hurt, carnage in the streets. They are looking for Allen. He tried to un unionize the world. And as a result, man, everybody is looking for him. He is, man, they're checking every uh, farmhouse to uh, house to outhouse. They're, they're going from riverbeds to haystacks. Man, there is a manhunt for Allen. He goes to his uh, girlfriend's house and says, look, you are right. It's time for us to go to America. She said, well, <laughs> why now? Well, it's just a good time. She says, it's a good time because everybody and their brother is looking for you. She said, you know, Alan, if you don't learn to sacrifice to do the right thing the right way, then all we're going to be doing is running into the same problem over there. It's just going to be delayed. He gave his word. Right, right thing, right way. They flee to Chicago. He goes to Chicago. And while he's there, the one thing Alan does do well, he makes beer barrels exceptionally well. You can imagine back in the day, man, he makes so many barrels that pretty soon it becomes a full-time job. He actually got a warehouse in Chicago. He is working 24-7. He's finally got a life he likes. He's got a good reputation. People know he's honest. Go figure. This is Alan. Next thing you know, when you work 24-7, let's be honest, you see things, you know things. Pretty soon he starts noting this behavior and that behavior, and next thing you know, it's kind of, man, something's not right. The sheriff's department comes to him, and man, there's a, um, there's a, there's kind of like a ring going around, like a uh, counterfeit ring. He starts helping the sheriff, they deputize him. Next thing you know, he becomes so popular in the sheriff's circles, he becomes a sheriff. Then next thing you know, they make him the head of the Chicago Police Department. Man, what? What sacrifices he must have made to go from where he was to where he is. Man, he gets so good, he decides he wants to start his own private detective agency. And he used to come up with a slogan, we never sleep. He had a big eyeball outside of his business. He had, he had a big eyeball outside his business. This is where we get the term private eye, just so you know. Thank, thank you, God. Okay. As a result of it, man, people start coming to him. Man, he is solving crimes. Things are going well. He is so good because he's willing to sacrifice what it is to do the right thing the right way, thanks to his wife. As a result of such, who all reaches out to him? Of all people, the president, soon to be, of the United States of America. He contacts Allen and tells him, look, I got to go from the southern states on this train all the way through Baltimore into D.C. There is no way I'm going to make it through the southern states. The war is about to embark. Yeah, you must have guessed by now. It was none other than president, soon to be, Abraham Lincoln. And as a result of it, Allen becomes his go-to guy. Allen is the one that gets him to D.C., albeit on the sly. Allen is the one that he counted on. Allen is the one that was willing to make the sacrifice for whatever it took. And you do know him. You know him as Allen Pinkerton and the Pinkertons. But here's what you don't know about it. At the end of the day, that proverbial night in Ford's Theater where the, where the president was shot by John Wilkes Booth during the play Our American Cousin, right, as John Wilkes Booth yells out death to tyrants as he kills the, Mr. Lincoln, you ever ask yourself, why wasn't Allen on guard that night? You know, they interviewed him and he said, he said, you know, I would have been willing to make any sacrifice that was necessary to be there for the president. That man had the biggest heart, the greatest mind, and was totally dedicated and sacrificial to rebringing our country back together. He said, well, man, that's a great statement. He said, but if you don't mind me asking you, where were you? He said, I was handling a fraud case in Louisiana. Imagine that. My brother and sister in Christ, it's all about the sacrifice. That is that gospel. It is more importantly to recognize that the rich man was not willing to sacrifice. Therein lies the problem. Now stop. You are a first century Jew. You and I now know, some 2,000 years later, that we must study Christ as a Jew. His mother is Jewish. His stepfather, you will, is Jewish. Their parents are Jewish. He's circumcised as a Jew. He is crucified as a Jew, as king of the Jews. We even find him in a synagogue at the age of 12. He is coming through the Jewish rite. So therefore, you and I must understand it in the text that is written. First and foremost, we do not believe this to be a parable. Why? Because a proper name was used, Lazarus. 
You need to understand that. Whenever you see a proper name, chances are it's not parabolic. Noah, Jonah, Brother in Christ, if they say the rich man, the poor man, the man on the side of the road, then I would tell you that, in essence, is a parable. This is not, hence the name. If I were to ask you what is the name of the couple in the Garden of Eden, most of you would probably shout out Adam and Eve. But the problem is, Adam, Adama, means ground. Eve does not get her name till after they're kicked out of the garden. Adam resumes his name. In the garden, they are man and woman. Hence why names are important. Hence why this cannot be so much parabolic. You need to understand, too, that if you wore purple clothing in their day, it's because you had the means. It took so many times to get the dye just right on the garment and to get it right where you wanted it on the garment and to make sure it was evenly spread, you had to have way means. For you to dine sumptuously each day meant even more money. If you lived in a gated community, and he did, he's at the gate, then you really had means. My brother and sister in Christ, you need to remember this in the, in the story, that he didn't kill anybody either. He just didn't love of neighbor. He got gluttonous, which is one of the seven deadly sins. He got prideful. He had avarice, love of money. So when, you, when I ask you, do you know the commandments, I hope and pray someday that you're able to recite them. Because you're not going to make heaven until you know them. You're not going to learn it after you get there. John said it in his gospel. If you say you love Jesus Christ, if you say you love Jesus Christ, you will know his commandments. One to ten in the order they're written. If, you're not, if you do not know Jesus Christ or you say you know him but you do not know the commandments, John's words, not mine, you are a liar. My brother and sister in Christ, I'm telling you this so that you realize that when you go to confession, you tell me, well, I haven't killed anybody. Good start, but it's one out of ten. You're not even a good baseball player. My brother in Christ, if you realize why they mention the dog in the scripture, to a Jewish people, dogs carry a lot of significance, unfortunately, in not a good way. You see, the dogs have to eat too, and they begin by licking the wounds of the dead person, so as soon as you do pass, they have something to eat. He's well on his way. If you notice, my brother in Christ, Peter's brother Andrew, who's died on a crucifix in the shape of an X, hence why I wear this garment in his name, the shape of the X. Do you know the reason they build the X? Because it's closer to the ground. So when they crucify you, they don't have to worry about taking you off because, well, there's dogs there. My brother and sister Christ, therein lies the point. You need to understand, my brother and sister in Christ, that as a Jew, you, know for, you knew without question that before the gates of heaven were open, you knew there was Abraham's bosom. Oh man, I hope you're going to love this. Purgatory. Stop looking for an English word in a book written in Greek. Philippians 2. Every name has been in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. You've been in knee in heaven before you're before the throne of God. You've been in knee on earth because you want to be before the throne of God. You've not been in the knee in hell. If you had been, you wouldn't be there to begin with. Where are you bending that knee below the earth? According to Padre Pio, that's where purgatory is. Padre Pio says hell is in the center of the earth. Why do I tell you that? Because this man has already re received his judgment. And there's a chasm that he will never cross. He's in hell. You ever ask yourself, how does he recognize Abraham? That's a thousand years before he ever got there. How does he know Abraham? You know what's a shame? The rich man will never be able to say, well, I didn't, see, I didn't see that guy standing by the gate. I didn't see him when I stepped over, much less when the dogs licked his wounds. Well, then how would you know his name? Why would you tell Father Abraham to tell Lazarus, treating him as a slave, to dip his finger and come? And look who he's talking to, Father Abraham. This is the greatest negotiator on the side of mankind ever. He's Father Abraham. He's, all in. he's the one that negotiated terms for Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, if I find 50... 40, 30, 20, 10, Lord, if I find it. He's telling this man, no. Well, you, if you send some, send, no. Well, if you send somebody to my, my brothers and my family, no. Well, you know, if somebody rises from the dead, no. It's over for him. The day is done. My brother and sister in Christ, because he wasn't willing to sacrifice. You know who's the greatest player in our game? Say what you will. But there is no doubt that Peter... Kephah, the massive boulder, best player we got, bar none. Why? Because Christ picked him. We didn't pick him. 
Say what you want about him, and I do too. But does it change the fact from the very beginning, the good Lord knew Kepha was going to be upon this rock, I will build my church. My brother and sister in Christ, he gives us a great example of what it means to be sacrificial. You remember the story, the good Lord is resurrected. He is now waiting on the Sea of Galilee, and he's now a charcoal fire. Peter sees him 50 yards away. Excuse me, 100 yards away, a football field away. Peter begins to swim to him. Nobody else gets out of the boat, just like he did when he tried to walk on water. Nobody got out of the boat. Nobody tried to help him. On a side note, can you imagine being there? Lord, if it is you, tell me to come. Come. Would you have gotten out of the boat? It meant it for everybody. Why did Peter have to be the only one? Knowing my nature, I probably would have convinced Judas this was his time to shine. But that's just my nature. My brother and sister Christ, he swims 100 yards to be next to a charcoal fire. Nowhere in Scripture is the word charcoal used other than here and when he denied our Savior three times. And as a result of it, he goes to him. Peter, Peter, do you love me? Well, well yes, Lord. You, you know that I do. Peter, do you love me? Well, well, well yeah, Lord. Peter! Do you love me? Well, man, you know everything. You know that I love you. Well, someday, Peter, they're going to take you where you do not wish to go, and they will clothe you in a certain manner, and albeit upside down for three hours, you will proclaim my gospel. Now you will know what it means to love me. God the Father said it best. I so love the world, I sent my son for the sacrifice of many. When you say you love someone... You're telling them that you're willing to sacrifice for them. If you're not willing to sacrifice for them, then please do not tell them that you love them. My brother and sister in Christ, that's what it means, agape, to love all in. Are you in, Peter, or are you not? My brother and sister in Christ, here you and I sit 2,000 years later. How sacrificial are you and I? Well, let's see. I tell you what, we'll start with the little things. When you're visiting with somebody and that phone rings and a text message has come across, you don't even bother moving it. You just sit there and continue your conversation. Far be it for you to be rude and inconsiderate and answer the text while you're talking. Or worse, pick up the phone while you're talking to them. Are you loving and sacrificial enough not to respond because the person in front of you is the most important person in the world as it would be if the shoe was on the other foot? My brother and sister in Christ, are you willing when you get home to make sure that you put the TV to the side and you put your cell phone to the side so that you can spend time with your family to be sacrificial for you love them? My brother and sister in Christ, are you willing when that alarm goes off in the morning? Could you set it just 10 minutes earlier and therefore get up a little bit earlier to start your day by praying and giving love to Christ? Saying, Christ, I love you so much that I'm willing to give up my first 10 or 15 minutes in the day. My brother in Christ, are you so quick to hit the snooze button? Which I got to tell you, I'm about convinced that the snooze button was invented by the devil himself. I say that with a kind heart. My brother and sister in Christ, are you willing to come home an hour early so that you can spend time with your family and that you will turn off the television and nobody is to respond to no texts, no phones at the table. We're going to sit and visit. And if it means we will sit and stare at one another, then so be it. Oh, we're going to start our prayer, our, our meal with the sign of the cross? Will you do it in public, clearly and distinctly, so that everybody knows that you're giving thanks to God and you are not blessing yourself. You are asking God to bless you and the food. My brother and sister in Christ, let's wrap it up a little bit. Are you willing to own up to the mistakes that you made, that you cannot have that one more drink? Because it's killing you and it's destroying your family that you can't get on the computer because the pornography is so great you can't kill it if you had to. Oh, Father, I, I, can, I can deal with it. Well, if you had been, we'd already solved the problem. It's obviously that we can't. So are you willing to put down Facebook for an hour a day? Can you walk away from it? My brother and sister in Christ, how sacrificial are you? How much do you love? Do you love God so much that you're willing to go to confession once a month? Once a month? And mother and sister in Christ, when you go to confession and you're waiting in line, can I ask you, why do you get so mad? 
You didn't have to hear the confession. I see your faces. Man, that guy's been up there 20 minutes. Oh, my God, what's he doing up there? It must be therapy. Well, I tell you what, come sit in my shoes, and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Here you are committing a sin to come confess your sin. That's the height of irony. My brother, sister Christ, do you know sometimes why I sit with my back to you? Because I don't want you to drop a bomb in my lap, and therefore I'm facing you, and then everybody sees this. Or worse, my brother, sister in Christ, I'm telling you, go to confession, find the priest that you can speak to, and throw up. I'm asking you to stop couching it. Hebrews 5, I will choose priests among men for the forgiveness of sins. No one is to take it upon themselves. Go back to St. John's Gospel around chapter 20. The ministry of reconciliation has been given to them. Go out and heal them and forgive them of their sins. St. Paul to the Corinthians. The ministry of reconciliation has been given to us. If I were to ask you, was confession in play before December 25th, second one of minute one of hour one? Was confession in play before Christ came in or did the church just make it up? Leviticus 4, 5, and 6. You had to bring your priest, an animal. You had to bring him either a goat, a turtle dove, or a bull, depending on the size of the animal, the size of the sin. Can you imagine walking through town with a bull? Nothing to see here. Look the other way. <laughs> Better yet, give it to your family. Look, go ahead and take it in. I'll catch up with you in a minute. And you had to announce it publicly. I want to make sure you understand this. That nowhere did Christ ever hear a confession in Scripture, and nor did he baptize anybody. Do not talk to me about his forgiveness of Peter. What's Peter's confession? That he loves him? What was Mary Magdalene, the lady being stoned, what was her confession? He said, go in peace and sin no more. My brother in Christ, will you able to go to one more mass? Just one more mass. Think about it. One more mass is greater according to St. Alphonse Liguori than all the prayers of the Blessed Mother, all her petitions, all her works, all her intercessions, along with Joseph, the prophets, and the apostles. Uno mass. And yet we don't have time for him. My brother and sister in Christ, are you willing to make that sacrifice? Because I'm going to tell you now, if you're not willing to sacrifice for your own soul, if you're not willing to sacrifice for the soul of your family, if you're not willing to make that extra sacrifice to come to Mass, then you will not sacrifice for your country nor your church. You're more interested in your own personal freedom than you are, my brother and sister Christ, than the freedoms of Holy Mother Church in the world. You've become narcissistic. Instead of worrying about the greater good. This is why you and I pray in a community. Remember, my brothers in Christ, what I'm telling you. Remember in the words of the Declaration of Independence. My brothers in Christ, the famous last words. How many times must you and I go over this? Enough for us to remember. With, the, with divine, think of the word. With total reliance. With total reliance on divine providence with total reliance on divine providence. We solemnly pledge to one another our lives, our fortunes, and our honors. And then they signed it. You could not have signed that declaration if you weren't all in. You wouldn't have been able to sign that declaration now, much less then. My brother in Christ, if you and I do not learn to sacrifice for one another and start praying for our country and our church, we're going to lose this battle. It is not going to be up to us anymore. We have lost that ability. When good men do nothing, evil prevails. Look at us now. We are falling. I'm begging you to come back to church, to go to Mass, receive the sacraments. But more importantly today, I'm asking you to man up or woman up and start coming to adoration and praying for our church and our country. If you've never been to adoration, it's that building just outside to the left. I'm asking you to go sit for one hour a week. You've got three members of your family, go every third week. If you have four members, you might have to get away with once a, once a month. If you're telling me you don't have time for one hour a week, you've spent more time on your cell phone than you do with Jesus Christ, you are disordered and you're on the road to perdition. My brother and sister in Christ, when you go to adoration, I tell you what, let's be novel. You're Catholics, bring a Bible. I tell you what, bring something scriptural. Bring a rosary. I don't care if you stare at him and he stares at you. You're there for the hour because you're telling the good Lord, I have come for my country and I've come for my church. Take it as you will. My brother Christ, listen to me. If you and I do not sacrifice for what we want, 
What we want will be the sacrifice. If you do not sacrifice for your church, the church will become the sacrifice. If you do not sacrifice for your country, the country will become the sacrifice. If you do not sacrifice for your family and our community, then that is what's going to be put on the burner. Brothers and sisters, Christ, it's time to man up and stop kowtowing to everything that comes down the pipe. I don't care what certain people say. All I care about is your soul and where you go. And if you're not willing to bend that knee, then nothing I can do to help you. You've got to get to adoration. You've got to get to the sacraments. You've got to get back in church. That is all we have. If we do not find our knees, I promise you, if we do not find our knees and bend that head, then the devil has this game won and there's, it's all over with. You learn to sacrifice. And may he pull it out of your dead hands when you're through. Amen? Amen. 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 There you go. Father, Son, Holy Please stand. Hang on a second. I got to catch my breath. <laughs> they asked me, Father, do you work out? I said, Yeah, I run off the reservation every Saturday and Sunday. That's what I do. <laughs> my brother and sister in Christ, you know, Ben Franklin made the statement that when you sign the Declaration of Independence, he made the statement that if you don't, we don't hang together, we'll hang separately. They all knew it was a death warrant. Matter of fact, that's why John Hancock wrote his name so big, so that every, even the king would know that he's diametrically opposed. He's the wealthiest man in all of the colonies. Here's the irony of irony. You don't think when they pinned their name to the Apostles' Creed, you don't think they were signing their death warrant too? Church and country. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you have in your pew the Apostles' Creed, each line delineated by the Apostle who said it. Pray with me our creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, St. Peter, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, St. Andrew, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, James the Greater, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, St. John. He descended into hell and he rose from the dead on the third day, St. Thomas. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, James the Lesser, from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead, St. Philip. I believe in the Holy Ghost, St. Bartholomew, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, St. Matthew, the forgiveness of sins, St. Simon, the resurrection of the body, St. Thaddeus, and life everlasting, St. Matthias. My brothers and sisters Christ, as we always do, two or three gathered in his name, we bring forth our public petitions. For the intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, Pope Emeritus Benedict, our Bishop Michael, all our clergy and religious, and for the intentions of all of us present today, we pray to the Lord. For all the holy souls in purgatory, heaven's hospital, we pray to the Lord. For an end to abortion and all sins against the dignity of human life, we pray to the Lord. For our parish to be ever more devoted to Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, we pray to the Lord. That many young people will respond to Christ's call to follow him in the consecrated life and in the priesthood, we pray to the Lord. For the grace this week to recognize those in our lives who are in need of kindness, healing, and charity, we pray to the Lord. For those for whom this Mass is being offered, for the sick, and for those who have died, especially Mrs. Vera Durr, we pray to the Lord. Most holy and gracious Father, that's what I'm talking about. While we're all gathered here, what is that one petition? Because actually we're all interceding on behalf of everybody else. So for that one petition in your heart, not a litany, the one thing that got you, the one thing that just dominates your prayers, your thoughts, your conversation, that is the intention you bring forward. And who better to intercede? The one that he called woman, telling everybody she's the new Eve at Cana. Again at the crucifixion. Who better than the mother of all living as we pray? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and to the hour of our death. Amen. Please be seated. As always, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we always designate the second collection. 
man is always right. We always want to make the grounds of Jesus Christ, his church, always more amenable, more pleasant, right? How many times do I hear people say, oh, Father, you're spending too much money on the grounds. So I should make his house less than. King David made that mistake. I'll never make that one. I'll make the other ones, but I won't make that one. Across the street, and many blessings to Full of Grace, right? And all the ministries that will come together. But for Full of Grace, for allowing us to take that parking lot, they're going to help us with paying with half of the blacktop so that we can park in a nice place so people that can come and visit can park in a nice place. And look, what I'm after is your prayer. You want to give money, God bless you. If you can't, God bless you as well. I need your prayers. That's the only way we're going to survive. Amen? Amen. Now, my brother and sister in Christ, imagine you've been chosen. You hear, the, you hear through the grapevine 2,000 years ago. You get a Facebook notice. Okay, good. Some of you are listening. You go to the Sea of Galilee. The one they call the Messiah has come. 5,000 men, 10,000 men, women, and children. They decide it is late. The good Lord says, now, y'all need to feed them. And one of the apostles, Philip, who speaks Greek, says, man, I can't, we can't feed that many people. There's just this young boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. Imagine, my brother and sister in Christ, if he didn't turn to the twelve and to you and said, Now, so that I may distribute the five loaves of bread and two fish, I need you to each go get a basket to distribute all what remains to the 10, 12,000 people. How big a basket would you have gone and gotten? A handful? A big gulp? Would you have brought a, a tub? The truth of the matter is there's a tradition in the church that he sent his 12 to go get it. The Pharisees came back with next to nothing. John came back with a pail so big he had a hard time carrying the pail. His faith was already there that the good Lord would multiply the loaves. The rest of them came with little handheld baskets. What is the, what is the measure of your faith? My brother in Christ, that's the people that are brought come up today. They are the child with the five loaves of bread and two fish that have come to feed so many. So there's a double blessing like that of Elijah. So never turn down the opportunity to feed everybody in the church that day. Lord God, I ask a special blessing that only he can bestow. He knew you in your mother's womb. He even knew your name. And he called you by name so that you would be his children. Lord, you mark the sign of the cross on their forehead and eventually will be baptized. But moreover, your shoulder to their back and your arm around them. May your face be on this family forevermore. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son 
in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So, oh, man, many blessings, little one. Thank you, thank you. Just bow, please. Just turn around and bow. Thank you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have the bread we offer, fruit of the earth, the work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Jesus Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. We place the water in the chalice, even if there were more chalices, because only his receives the, the water, because blood and water flew from his side. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have the wine we offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, become for us our spiritual drink. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be acceptable to you, O Lord. May our sacrifice and yours be acceptable to you, Lord God. Lord, just like in the book of Revelations, may our petitions rise before you in the petition to bless your gifts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, may my petition arise before you. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please stand so your petitions may rise as well. Lord, wash away my iniquities. Cleanse me from all of my sins. For my offense is always before me. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Remember, my friends in Christ, everything in the Mass is scriptural. Nothing is made up. I wash my hands because the high priest, and even then they would enter the temple washing their hands and their feet. They would enter a house and do the same thing. So when you enter the house of Christ, you dip your hands in the holy water, you bless yourselves. You're asking God to bless you. You're not blessing yourself. Excuse me. You're asking God to bless you right before you enter his house, and then you ask for his blessing before you leave. Hence why I wash my hands, for we're about to touch him. Amen? Amen. Pray, brother, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Lord, look merciful upon the people who have gathered here today in St. Helena. Lord, may you accept them, their intentions to do your will. The wellspring of all blessing, may they be laid open before us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Out of the compassion for the waywardness, which is all ours, you humbled yourself to be born of the Virgin. By your passion on the cross, you freed us from an unending death, and rising from the dead, you gave us life eternal. And so, Father, with all the angels and archangels, the thrones and dominions and the powers of heaven, we proclaim your glory without end as we acclaim. Please kneel or be seated. My friends in Christ, as always, the journey of Christ now continues. Welcome, welcome to the Last Supper. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all that you created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things, you make all things holy. You never cease to gather people to yourself. 
so that from the rising of the sun to the setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered in your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy the gifts that are brought to you for consecration. So that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate this mystery. On the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. Giving thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we actually believe Christ raised the host and the chalice at the Last Supper, so John would understand that when he went out and saw the crucifix being raised and with Christ on it, it was exactly the same thing. His body, blood, soul, and divinity. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. In memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate your memorial, the saving passion of your Son, his glorious resurrection, his ascension to heaven, we look forward to a second coming. We offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblations of Holy Mother Church, recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you reconciled to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by this body and blood, may be filled with the Holy Spirit, become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain the inheritance of your elect, especially the most holy and blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, along with blessed Saint Joseph, her chaste spouse, the apostles, the martyrs, the saints, like your namesake, Galena, whose constant intercession in your presence, we still rely for help. Lord, may this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity, Holy Mother Church on earth, your servant, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, Michael, our bishop, the clergy, but none more important than those who have gathered here this day. Father, listen graciously to the prayers of family gathered before you. And in your mercy, Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters who have left this world pleasing to you, like my father and Mr. Raleigh. To our departed brothers and sisters, give kind of minutes into your kingdom. For we hope to share forever the vision of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, from whom you bestowed all in the world, that which is good. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in unity with the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At our Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to sing.
brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm about to raise my hand. I ask you genuinely and honestly, and I mean this very kindly, do not raise yours. Ever since the golden calf incident, prior to that point, you dads were allowed to raise your hand because you offered the sacrifice. Once the sacrifice took place where they worshiped the golden calf, they started a priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. Only then could we raise our hands to God. So I am standing for you, so allow me to be the only one to raise my hand. It's the tradition and teachings. It's scriptural. Amen? Amen. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of Holy Mother Church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance to your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. If you would please kneel as I approach the tabernacle. The sign of peace is optional. And it's truly most inopportune time as I repose him from the tabernacle. Hence why we prefer to kneel as we approach him. May the mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to those who receive him. We break a piece off, so the sacrifice is now complete. I'll put the host in the shape of a crucifix, so you now know that we approach Golgotha. I will pray my act of contrition aloud. I ask that you pray yours quietly and po before you receive me. May the receiving of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ not bring me to judgment or condemnation, but in your loving mercy be protection for me and mind and body and a healing remedy. We'll put the host back together as best we can. It symbolizes the resurrection for it is now complete and he has now been raised as we raise the chalice. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to, to the sacrifice of the Lamb. Lord. My brother and sister in Christ, he was made known to the two travelers on the road to Emmaus that he's in the breaking of the bread. You ever ask yourself, why does Melchizedek show up in the middle of nowhere? He has no beginning, no end, no mother, no father. He's called the king of righteousness, the king of peace. My brother and sister in Christ, it's Christ, a foretelling of when he comes, no beginning and no end. That when he comes, he's going to offer bread and wine. He offers this to Father Abraham, the same one that negotiated with Lazarus and the rich man. He brings him bread and wine, a foretelling of what's how come. Ask yourselves, how else would you partake of him? We're not cannibalistic. He's got to put it in a way that only you and I can understand it or would accept it in the bread. That's why he's born in the city of bread. That's why he's born in manger, manja to eat. That's why he's called the bread of life. 
He's in the bread. He is the bread. Well, brother in Christ, if you're not of our faith, outside the church, you're mismatched. I understand that too. Have the courage to be sacrificial and walk up and put your hands over your heart. Allow me to pray for you and your family. Two or three gather in his name. You've lost nothing and gained everything. I'm just asking you to be honest. Amen? Amen. Please come.
Christ on his set. He knew that he would soon be dead. He said, did you forget me, Father, did you? They nailed him to a wooden cross. Soon all the world would feel a loss of Christ the King before his I am coming home now, Father, to you. A reed which held his final sip was gently lifted to his lips. He drank his last and he gave his soul to glory. To pierce the body of our Lord Said truly, this is Jesus Christ our Savior He looked with fear upon the sword And turned to face his Christ and Lord Fell to his knees took from his head the thorny crown and wrapped him in a linen gown and laid him down to rest inside the tomb the holes in his hands his feet and side now in our hearts we know he died to save us from ourselves oh,
Please stand. And may the good Lord bless you twofold for kneeling while we still had him on the altar, to reposing, to clean the altar. May the blessing upon you be twofold. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Man, let us pray. Lord, we gathered here in Holy Mother Church. May we be co-heirs of glory with you and your Son. Give us the ability to persevere, to offer the sacrifice for our country and your church. Moreover, Lord, may your face forever be upon us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray the prayer to St. Michael. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace. Let's pray for that protection, right? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The same prayer of exorcism at baptism. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and that of his Holy Mother, I demand and command that he hexes, vexes, triggers, trances, vows, demonic blessings among those who have gathered for their loved ones and their possessions. Through the authority of Holy Mother Church, I bind you separately, I bind you individually. I break all seals and they are bound. They're done so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray that beautiful prayer told us to us. Totally yours, Immaculate Conception. Mary, my mother, live in me, act in me, speak in and through me. Think your thoughts in my mind and love through my heart. Give me your disposition. Give me your feelings. Teach and lead and guide me to your son, Jesus. Correct and light and expand my thoughts and behavior. Possess my very soul. Take over my entire personality, my life, and replace it with yourself. Incline me to constant adoration. Pray in me and through me. And let me live in you and keep me in union with you always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My brother and sister Christ, as always, thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing the Mass with me. My brother in Christ, remember this. Confessions are on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Before you leave today, there will be a sheet of paper with different phone numbers from Monday to Saturday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If for some reason... You cannot make it between those hours? Well, then come when you can. I mean, just don't mail it in. Well, Father, I can't get there until 8 o'clock at night. Then so be it. Just let the captain know on that day that you'll go at 8. If you can't make it, that's okay. It's our job. You can't make it. You call the captain of that day. That's the phone number on the sheet of paper. Each Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday has one person in charge. Their job is to fill the hole. If they can't fill it, then I'm going to fill it with my staff. But we're going to man it from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Because if we don't, then our firm reliance upon divine providence was a lie. And I won't have it. We can't have it. We must sacrifice. Think about it. I want you to come. Do the best you can. If you can't make it, then make what you can. If you can only go on certain hours with somebody else, then that's what you make. Make what you can make. We've got to fill it. You've got to come. We've got to bend our knee. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen. I mean, you all have a great day.